Um, and we are here today to talk with you about DBT, um, specifically modernizing your data transformations with DBT. So super exciting topic that we're very anxious to share with you all. Um, real quickly, before we kind of dive into some more of the details, we'll give a quick introduction of ourselves. Um, I'll start. Uh, my name is Dustin Dorsey. I'm a senior data architect um, for a healthcare startup here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm one of the founders and organizers of the Nashville Data Engineering Group. Um, I recently wrote a book with some very smart individuals about database migrations to Azure. Um, it's been out a little less than two months at this point that if you're looking to um, uh, move your on-prem databases to the cloud, you should definitely check that out. There's a lot of really great information in there. Um, another interesting fact before I kick it over to Gerald to give a little bit of information about himself is we are live and we are coming live from opposite ends of the globe. So I'm in the U.S. and Gerald is in New Zealand. So we are as far apart as you can possibly get. Um, thank you to technology for that. So uh, Gerald, kick it over to you. Sure. Thank you very much, Dustin. And morena kia koutou to everyone. Greetings from New Zealand. It is indeed the morning here in New Zealand, nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Couldn't imagine uh, being anywhere else than here right now. My name is Gerald Hartley. I'm te currently team lead of Enterprise Data and BI in, in Environment Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. Been in the BI space for about 10 year, around about 10 years so far. So I learned a lot of lessons along the way. And I'm actually relatively new to DBT. So I've recently encountered it in a, in a particular project that I'm working with now. So I'm kind of relatively new to the game, but like a lot of you watching here today, there'll be a lot of people who aren't familiar with it and I'm coming from it with a new set of eyes. So if it's easy enough for me to pick up, hopefully it'll be the same for you. Dustin. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Gerald. So, all right. So what are we going to talk about today? What is, what are we going to cover? So this, um, just to help set the stage, this is a very entry level foundational um, look at DBT. So this is, if you're coming from a background where you've maybe heard about it, know a little bit about it, but never really used it, or maybe you know nothing about it and you just saw data transformation and, and thought, oh, this looks interesting. Uh, this session is going to be for you. If you're an experienced uh, DBT developer or analytics engineer and you've been doing this stuff for, for quite some time, and there may not be a whole lot that's new to you through, through this particular session. But certainly if you're wanting to explore it, understand what it is, we're gonna cover that um, um, in a lot of detail. Um, the first half of this session is gonna be primarily slides. So we're gonna talk about it. And then the latter half of it, where we're going to dive into demos and really start to show you some of this stuff. So if there's things that you hear us talk about in the beginning and you feel a little bit lost, um, don't worry. We're also going to show the same stuff once we get into the demos. Um, we're going to focus on what is DBT and, and, and specifically also what it isn't. Um, we're going to look at how does this fit into the modern data stack when we think of that. Um, what are the benefits of using it? What are some of the fundamental things that you need to know to be able to get started? And then like we talked about um, the latter part, we're really gonna dive into it and actually start to look at this. All right, so what is DBT? So DBT is an open source command line tool used to transform data in warehouses using SQL. Um, it makes data engineering activities accessible to people with data analyst skills. So this is a data transformation tool. Um, if you see the chart that we have on there, um, DBT is um, pretty known for coining the term analytics engineer. You may have seen these roles um, if you've done some job searches or you may have seen it in blog posts. But basically what this means is they've created a tool that takes the skills that a data analyst would have or, or a SQL developer or someone comfortable writing SQL. Um, and it's put a built a bridge way for that to be able to go into data engineering. So analysts typically doing some sort of data an analysis or building dashboard reports or building queries against data. Um, data engineers um, are generally building like ETL, ELT pipelines or doing some form of data modeling or transforming source data. What DBT does is it takes the skills that um, someone who's comfortable as a data analyst, comfortable writing SQL, and it gives them a segue to be able to go into to kind of the data engineering realm, hence where that term analytics engineer comes from. Um, Gerald, anything to add here from your end of your perspective, what is DBT to you? 
Okay, so from joining from a fresh new project and seeing uh, from a new set of eyes, probably the daunting thing was that it very much adheres to the the focus around software development. It looks like a very much a software development product, and which is daunting for those coming from a BI space where you, sometimes you're able to get away with never touching a line of code other than SQL. But but it's right; it makes it very accessible to be able to bring that functionality that's also dearly missing from some of the BI development tools. So uh, can definitely endorse uh, in that respect. Yeah, no, great, good points there. And also kind of leads into what we're gonna talk about next. You mentioned some of those software development best practices, um, but it kind of goes along with this of, okay, how does DBT fit into the modern data stack? So within the modern data stack, Typically, you have something that's loading data. You've got source data that lives, that could live in a variety of systems. You're pulling that data from those source systems, the raw data, and you're either landing it potentially in a data lake, or you could be landing it directly on a data store like a Snowflake. Um, but somehow you have to pull that data um, to get it into your warehouse or whatever the data store that you're using is. Um, DBT does not load your raw data. It's not a data loader. It's not an extract load tool. It is strictly a transformation tool. So it does depend on you getting the data landed in a data store that you plan to do the transformations in. So I'm going to transform it, move it anywhere. It's only going to do it on the system that, um, that it's running on. Um, once the data is landed, this is where DBT really begins to shine. Um, typically, if you just kind of think about best practices when you're building warehouse, um, you, once you land the raw data, there may be some form of snapshotting that happens. Um, if you've got large volumes of raw data, you may only want to pull out change data from that. So you may do some form of snapshotting to go in and say, hey, I only want to pull out change data because I only want to transform that. Um, the next step is you would go through some, some form of transformation on that data. Um, to get it into whatever toward, toward a, um, sort of modeling scheme that you're using, whether it's dimensional or data vault or whatever it may be. Um, you would apply tests against that data to make sure that the, the data is good and that there's not any issues with it. You would deploy that and then you would document that. All of those things are built-in components within DBT. And we're going to talk about those a little bit more throughout this session of, of what some of those um, some of those are. In addition, again, within the software development best practices, that typically involves version control, alerting, and logging. Um, and all of those things are self-contained within, within DBT. You're not having to go out and use a lot of other tools. Um, DBT makes it very easy to be able to do these things. Um, once it goes through that process of snapshotting, transforming, testing, deploy, documenting, um, you then have your transformed data which is the final layer of that DBT puts it into. Um, and then that data is then accessible through BI tools, um, reporting tools like a Power BI, Looker, or whatever you may be using, or available to data science teams to be able to go in and create models against that. Um, but again, just to kind of focus on the core component of DBT here, DBT is everything in between the raw data and to the transformed data and all the different components um, that exist within that. All right, so that was a quick rundown and don't worry if you're still kind of a little bit confused on some of that because we're gonna go into more detail on it, but wanted to give you a high level picture of where that fits in. Um, the skills needed, anytime I hear about a new tool, I always appreciate when someone tells me what skills do I need to be able to do this. Um, one of the, the great things about DBT is, and the reason that it's, um, the adoption rate is just getting so much higher is because the primary skill that you need for this is SQL. If you know how to write a basic select statement, you are capable of using DBT. Um, most of the of what you are building in it is all SQL models. Um, kind of think of it like kind of like writing modular store procedures, um, where you're writing SQL code to be able to do things. Um, um, but it's kind of a little bit different way of thinking about it in terms of how you how you model it. But yeah, like kind of like mo modular um, store procedures. But SQL is the main skill that you need to be able to use this. Um, in fact, even when you use the other um, languages that exist 
um, within it, it still converts those and compiles those to SQL. So even if you're running something in Jinja, you're still able to do that. Um, the second skill is Jinja. Um, Jinja is a templ templating language for Python developers. Um, you do not need to be a Python expert to use DBT. Um, there are a couple of commands that are used uh, most often. Um, Jinja commands that you really have to use in order to really take advantage of DBT. You don't, well, you could do it without it, but I wouldn't recommend it um, that we're going to talk about. Um, but it's not, it's not a hard skill to learn. If, again, if you know SQL, you can learn the Jinja. There's basic Jinja that you need to know um, that it, you're going to be successful, successful using it. Um, the third skill is YAML. So all of the configuration and property information is all stored in YAML files. Again, you may have worked with YAML with some other services before and not a huge fan of it, which I totally understand, but it's not very difficult to use within DBT. Again, I kind of go back to this. If you know SQL, you can learn the Jinja and the YAML components. Um, they are adding the ability to be able to run Python models within DBT. This is currently, I believe, in private preview. Um, this is not intended to replace the SQL functionality, so it's still predominantly going to be um, transformations done um, using SQL scripts, but it's going to be an added layer where if there's some things like, oh, this would be much easier, it's going to be more of a complementary feature to the SQL that exists um, within it. But you don't have to know Python again, um, but it may help um, if, you, if you do. Um, anything to add there, Gerald? Um, you've kind of mentioned a little bit of your background, but any anything to, that you want to add here? I suppose in the in the sense my core background comes from SQL querying of a lot. Most obviously, most skilled and experienced in the SQL querying. But coming into a new project, using the basic out of the box features such as referencing other models or such as querying from other sources that was fairly straightforward for the 80 percent of the work that you'll be doing you'll be using the the main out of the box commands which are very intuitive to use uh, for someone coming into it new deal all right so some quick things to know about dbt before we start diving a little more into the details of what projects look like and and how you structure these um I'm going to say this again because I really want to hammer it home. Uh, DBT is not an ETL ELT tool. It is a transformation tool. If you need to extract and load data or you need to be able to move data between other systems, you have to pair it with another tool. Um, and typically those are going to be, depending on which cloud solution you're working in, um, you may be using one of those. You could be using a third-party tool or you could be using a tool like Fivetran that just copies the data directly into your warehouse. Um, you're going to have to pair it with something else. It's not an all-in-one tool. Um, the second thing is every model that you create um, is written as a select statement. So this coming from working on, um, I come from a Synapse background where I've done a lot of development um, using Synapse SQL pools, um, and we did a lot of transformations through Azure Data Factory and Store Procedures, um, and there was a lot of different commands in there. If you come from the BI world and you've you've done a lot of transformation in data, you're probably running merge commands and upserts and updates, deletes, inserts, et cetera. You can't do those in DBT, well, at least not explicitly. Every model that you're going to build is going to be written as a select statement. So if you, um, there's configurations within DBT um, where you tell DBT like what something is based on kind of what the model type is that will behind the scenes run some of those commands, but in terms of what you're writing, you're always writing a select statement. Um, processing and compute happens at the database level. So DBT in and of itself doesn't come with any compute associated with it. It's not, the compute with it is not handling your transformations. You, the commands that are getting executed through your models are going to be executing at the data store level. So. If you have DBT and it's connected to Snowflake, which is what we're gonna show you in the demo a little bit later, when you execute those models, it's using the compute on Snowflake, um, not in and of itself. And then the last point here, just to be aware of, is DBT builds your database objects for you. So you don't have to go in and lay down your tables and your object schema before you actually build your transformations. DBT is actually gonna handle this for you. So you're gonna build models 
um, within DBT that are going to be select statements. Um, and it's going to infer the schema um, from your models to actually build your tables. You can go in and lay down the table like you still have to model what you want it to look like if you're using this for a warehouse. But you don't have to go in and lay down those tables first. DBT can create those for you. And depending on what model you're using, it could, or a materialization for the model that you're using, it could recreate those each time um, that you run it anyways. So even if you do lay it down, it's going to get um, recreated anyways. Um, any points there, Gerald, before we, maybe before we move on here? I think that's the huge win in terms of uh, not having to handle the database objects directly. No hit and runs on a Friday when someone goes in and makes a change and everything breaks because of something in the database. Probably the daunting thing being everything is written as a select statement. We're probably used to seeing large monolith stored procedures doing a chain of commands one after the other, and we have direct control over that. But by breaking it down and making the select statements a bit more granular, we can actually track the lineage across that and have a lot more visibility over what we're producing from end to end. Yep. Good. All right, so let's talk about some of the benefits of DBT here real quick. So one of the biggest benefits of DBT, and again, why so many people use this tool, is because there's a very low learning curve for those that already know SQL. So if you know SQL and you are comfortable writing SQL, the learning curve for this is, is not very high at all, um, which makes it a, a really great tool. Again, if you're coming from a SQL background, you're moving into the analytics space, um, it makes it a pretty natural progression for you to be able to, 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 be able to use this. A DBT does handle the order of operations for you. Um, Gerald just kind of hit on, hit on this with the data, data lineage um, point of view, but there's no dragging and dropping. There's no GUI where you have to go in and you have to tell this, oh, I need you to run this model before this model before this model. Um, DBT handles that for you and actually handles it through Jinja where you can reference other models, you through code, through very simple lines of code, can reference other models in DBT when it runs, knows the right order to be able to run your transformations in. So if you're going from a raw data into a staging table, into a final table, obviously you need your staging, um, the transformation into the staging table to happen first before it loads into the final model. But those are done using a very simple Jinja command through your code. So it actually builds the lineage for you. You don't have to go in and actually create your own pipelines um, to be able to do that. It actually creates a DAG for you as well. Um, so you can actually see all of the dependencies that DBT recognizes that has the run before and where all of your data comes from um, throughout the pipelines. Um, it does, we talked a little bit about this earlier. It does incorporate software development best practices. Um, we saw this when we were looking at um, how DBT fits within the modern data stack. So this means their source control integration. The, um, it's really big on code reusability. So it means no boilerplate co code. Um, if you're using sort procedures or you're doing something in SQL, you may have a lot of repetitive code. Um, with DBT, you can modularize that and actually split some of that out so you can reuse code um, in multiple places without having to just copy and paste it and put it in new things. Um, incorporated testing. There's a lot of functionality um, baked into DBT. There's a lot of automated tests um, that you can just go in and add a couple lines in a YAML file and it'll run tests um, against your data. Um, you can also build your own tests um, against it. So if there's something a little more complex or something specific to your use case, you can build those tests um, directly within DBT. And every time um, your process runs or your models build, it'll execute those tests. Um, automated documentation. This is really big. I mean, especially us as developers, documentation typically isn't one of our favorite things to do. And it's typically one of those things that um, get kind of brushed to the side because there seems to always be something a little more important. Um, with DBT, it actually builds your documentation for you by pulling in metadata, by reading information from the YAML files, and it puts it in a really nice, uh, on a nice web UI if you're using DBT Cloud. Um, and Daryl's actually going to show it a great example of this a little bit later too. So, um, but it's pretty awesome that it automatically is going to build that documentation for you that anyone, you can give anyone the ability to be able to go in and see. 
um, CI CD pipelines and environment configurations, um, individual development schemas, um, developer schemas for development. So if you have multiple developers working on the same database in a development environment, um, DBT makes it very easy via separate schemas to be able to separate your environments. So you're not running over top of each other working on it. And you're not having to have developers work off of their own local machine because they're trying to have isolated environments or try to have to build um, individual environments for them. And then the last one is it is an open source tool. So that means it is customizable. Um, you can change um, the way DBT handles cer um, certain things. And there are some cases where you may want to do this. I have done this before in the past um, where we have changed behavior, not anything extravagant though. And then also shared code. There's a lot of projects that exist out there, DBT projects, to be able to look at and analyze and view data um, that's just freely available out there for you to go and pull. So if you're pulling in data sources that you're maybe you're not necessarily familiar with, um, take for instance, like you just started working with marketing data and you're using pulling in Facebook data, Twitter data, or any sort of social media data, um, there's actually op there's there's uh, DBT projects that exist out there where someone has already done that modeling work for you that you can literally go out, you pull a snippet of code, you put it in a package, your package.yaml file and run a command and boom, you have access to all of that modeled, all of those models that someone else has built for you to be able to get in and understand and be able to use. Um, and you can do that, it takes a few minutes and you've got, got a model sitting there to be able to look at that data. All right, so available adapters. What can you actually connect DBT to? So DBT supports pretty much can be connected to any SQL speaking database or warehouse data lake query engine or analytical platforms by means of an adapter plugin. Because everything runs at the database level, you can pretty much you can pretty much connect this to anything um, that you want to. But of the connectors um, were that are already built. Um, you can see those on the screen and you probably see a lot of familiar ones that are listed on there. The DBT Lab supported ones are ones that if you're using DBT Cloud, which is their hosted version of DBT that comes at a cost. Um, if you're using that, that can only connect to the DBT Lab supported ones. So Postgres, Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery, um, and Spark. Um, vendor supported, those mean that um, vendor, those specific vendors support those um, DBT adapters. And then there's the community supported ones that you see on the far right, which are, are supported by the community. Um, SQL Server, Azure SQL, and Synapse Analytics, since we are a Microsoft conference, this is a Microsoft conference. Um, those are only community supported now, which means you would have to use DBT Core to be able to use those. Um, but I would anticipate within the near future to see those. Um, branch more into the DB, DBT lab supported, especially since a lot of people who are coming from that Microsoft background, it's such an easy transition to this tool to be able to do transformations. All right, so DBT core versus DBT cloud. So what are the difference of these? So DBT core is essentially the code base. This is a free to use command line interface um, version of DBT that you can go and you can pull off the web today and you can start using it. There's no cost um, to be able to do that. You do need a tool to be able to manage it. Um, what I've seen most often used is VS Code. Um, you can create your project within, within that and manage it, but there's probably tons of tools out there that you could go and, and be able to pull DBT core and be, and be able to use it. Um, DBT core, if we I kind of kick back here, um, you have to use DBT core if you're doing a vendor supported or a community supported. The only ones that are DBT cloud that you can use are the DBT lab supported. Uh, DBT cloud, though, is the DBT labs hosted service. Um, so it has a browser based IDE. It does have hosted compute, but it's just the compute to power the IDE. Again, you're not your transformations, they're not using the compute from that, still using your warehouse. And there's also a job scheduling component, um, which DBT does host the compute for, for that as well. Um, with DBT Core, there's no job scheduler, there's no IDE um, that exists there. You have to be on DBT Cloud to be able to take advantage of those. Uh, DBT Cloud also has, um, 
A little more advanced logging and alerting capability. There's GitHub and GitLab integration. That website that I was talking about with the documentation um, only exists with DBT Cloud. Um, but obviously, DBT Cloud does come, you do have to pay for it, um, if you're going to use it for a team at least. There is tiered pricing with that. Uh, the developer tier is actually free, but you can only have one developer um, on it at a time. You can't share your project with a team of developers. If you want to share it with a team, you've got to move to a team tier, which is $50 per month per developer. So it's really still not that much expensive. Um, enterprise tier um, has is kind of their enterprise level um, that comes with a lot of additional security stuff, um, training, higher level of support. That's kind of their, their grand package. Um, and you would want to reach out to them to talk through pricing if you were interested in that. But if you're wanting to try DBT out, um, I would recommend just creating, getting a developer um, license for it, which is free for DBT Cloud. That's what we're going to show in the demo as well as DBT Cloud um, and go in there and just play with it. Um, you can absolutely use DBT Core. There's just a little more work on the setup. DBT Cloud, you can pretty much get started and roll in within just a few minutes. Um, all right, Gerald, anything you want to add on any of these last few slides? Um, as, as far as my use goes, the the probably big benefit around DBT Core is what, what I got introduced to is it just fits really nicely with existing software development or app development packages. So that, that it has a really good fit in being able to have that, that resource locally. Uh, but DBT Cloud is, if you're working on any new projects like I've been doing recently, then it's just so seamless to set up and get up and running in the first instance. So that's that's what we'll be demo, demoing today in terms of its uh, ease of use. Yeah, good deal. All right, so real quick, kind of getting into the actual project before we get into the demos here and, and talking about just a few more items. So once you get into the project, everything is file-based and then split within folders. Doesn't matter if you're using DBT Core or using DBT Cloud. Um, you'll see several folders that exist um, within your project. Um, just to run through these very quickly, again, you're pretty much creating SQL files. When you create these items, they're all going to be select statements. Um, macros, when you get into the macro location, these are like functions in SQL. So these are re really ways that you can really take a lot of advantage of the power of, of DBT. And typically, there's a lot of Jinja. If you're creating grid macros to be able to do things, they're pretty heavy in the Jinja realm. Um, models, which is primarily what you're going to be writing, and these are your transformations. Um, these are the SQL select statements to perform your transformation. So again, you're, you're writing select statements to transform your data, um, and then you can materialize those in, in a lot of different ways, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, seed files or seeds are CSV files. So if you have small um, typically unchanging data sets that you just need to reside um, in there. You can create um, CSV files and load them up into seeds. Snapshots are just another type of model. They're just split out, but these are very similar to type two slowly changing dimensions. Um, tests, um, which are self-explanatory, those are tests against your model. So if you want to create custom tests, you can do it there. And then YAML files. So you have your YAML files in there that tells DBT how to use your project um, with it. All right, so model type. So we talked about models there, that model, a model being a select statement, but there are different ways that you can materialize a model. So a model can be um, materialized as an ephemeral, which is like a CTE. So this is just the result set that gets stored in memory. Um, it could be a view, and this is just a standard database view. It could be materialized as a database table. Um, just a quick note, if you do materialize as a database table, it will recreate that um, table every time that it runs. If you need to be able to incrementally load or you need to be able to track history, then that's where the incremental and the snapshot um, materializations come in. So an incremental is a table, but it can be, can be configured to insert, update new records. You still write it as a select statement. There's just a configuration block that you add that tells DBT how to interpret it. 
and it'll actually only load in change data. So if you're working with large data sets, um, you're probably going to use an incremental at some point. And then a snapshot, again, type 2 slowly, change, slowly changing dimension. When you run these, so you have a project and you're building models and you have your, you've written your SQL select commands and, they're, and you're ready to run them, how do you run them? So dbt objects are executed by running command line statements. Um, we mentioned that this is a command line tool, but it's not a very complicated um, command line tool. The commands that you run are fairly simple. Um, you can see some of the most common commands that you may run to execute certain things within your project listed on the screen. There are additional things that you can tag onto those. Um, the most common one, if you were to go, let's get ahead there, that if you were to go through um, like introductory level training, you're gonna the first command you're ever gonna run is a dbt run. dbt run runs all the models in your project. Um, so if I have a handful of models in there and I go down to the um, the command line, I can hit dbt run. It's gonna run everything in my project. Where the additional items get added on is if I only want to run select and select models, um, then there's additional things I can tag onto it. But again, it doesn't get very difficult. Um, I do have a link on there if you're kind of interested in looking more at those commands. Um, but again, as we get into the demo here shortly, um, Gerald's going to show you some of those in action and just how simple it is. In terms of YAML, there are two types of YAMLs, um, YAML types within your project. There's properties and configurations. Um, properties generally declare things about your project resources. So these are things like descriptions and tests and sources and exposures. Configurations tell dbt how to build resources in your warehouse or in your data store. So these are things like materializations, object locations, and tagging, um, and those sorts of things. Um, within the YAML files that you have, there's one YAML file that is, you're always going to have anytime you're working with dbt, and that is the dbt underscore project.yaml file. This contains important information that tells dbt how to operate in your project. This, you will have one of these per dbt project that you have. Um, it'll come with some pre-configured information in it that you don't really have to change. Not if you're using dbt cloud, if you're using dbt core, you do. But there, um, this is where you would just change things about how dbt knows how to work on your project. This is how it knows which folders to look into. Um, you can set it certain folders to materialize certain ways. And there's a lot of control that you have there. Um, you can have additional YAML files, and most likely that you will, that will exist in your models folders. And these will contain things like sources and tests um, and more of kind of that secondary area of YAML that we were talking about. And then the last thing before we get into the demo here, just some of the most important Jinja commands. We talked about Jinja. Jinja kind of takes your writing your SQL to a whole nother level within dbt, and it makes writing code just so much simpler where you can run um, potentially a Jinja command to do something that would have taken you like tons and tons of lines of SQL to be able to run. So it really speeds things up. But the two most important Jinja commands that you pretty much have to know um, when you start using dbt is the ref function and the source function. The ref function is used is what you is used to reference another model. So this is what builds the lineage within your project and tells dbt how to order the run. It also builds the DAG. So we used the example earlier where you've got raw source data coming in. You need to transform that into a staging table and then from a staging table into your final table. You would use the ref function on the transformation to your final table to reference your staging table. So dbt then knows, okay, I need to transform into the staging table before I load into the final table. And then the source function um, references your sources contained in the YAML files to know what objects to query. You don't have to use a source function. You can go in there and you can hard code your table names and your database names and your schema names. Um, but it's not really very good practice, especially if you're going to be moving that between environments. Um, so what dbt allows you to do is you can create a source.yaml file or sometimes called schema.yaml file, but you can name it whatever you want which you can reference sources within it. You can give the database name, you can give the table names, you can give the schema name. Um, you can actually um, parameterize those and create variables 
so that as you move your DBT project between environments, so for example, if you've got a dev, a QA, and a prod environment, then as you move those between those environments, if the database names or schema names or any of that changes, DBT knows how to interpret that as you move it between the environments. All right, so a lot of talking from my end. I know we wanted to try to get some of that information out to you all, but I'm going to kick it over to Gerald to actually show some of what we just said, um, show us how this stuff actually looks in action. Fantastic. And hopefully you should be share, uh, seeing my screen soon, if not now. And if that's the case, we're ready to go. Is it looking good, Dustin? Yeah, looks good. Yep. Fantastic. Great. And so now we're just going to have a start with a quick lay of the land in terms of the data set that we're using. So at the moment, we have two databases running on our Snowflake instance. We've got analytics is where our models will be deployed to, and we've got our raw database, which holds the database that we're going to extract insights from. Now, note the sample database is called FightDB. And if you're thinking FightDB, you might be thinking boxing, kickboxing, mixed martial arts or similar. But no, we've chosen a use case that's much more real to us, and that is professional wrestling a topic where Dustin and I both uh, share a common bond and is perfectly fine for guys our age to watch and enjoy. But it's not the most tidiest database, as you can see. We've got one wrestler's table, which has profiles about the athletes in terms of date of birth, uh, the number of counter matches they have, their names, preferred names, ring names. And then we've got matches. Now, th these are the total amount of matches that each wrestler has had in their career, but it's in a format where it's one table per wrestler, which isn't the most tidiest thing, but in our industry, we don't always get the luxury of clean data sets. So this is what something we're gonna deal with, and I'll show you how that all fits together. In terms of setting up from uh, setting up DBT in the cloud, uh, as we mentioned, Snowflake is a DBT Labs supported partner. So it's actually quite easy to quickly set up with DBT uh, by using the Partner Connect option and just searching up DBT. Clicking on that, you provide the details that you need, the warehouse that you'll be looking at, uh, that you'll be using, the user accounts and the roles that you need. Just to note, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the DBT project and a warehouse instance in Snowflake. So if you're thinking of transforming across multiple uh, warehouses for some reason, you might run into trouble. However, we can have multiple projects in the DBT. Uh, we, we can have multiple DBT projects as well. Cool. And so we'll move into DBT. So we'll, we'll give you a quick rundown of what you'll see once you've got DBT Cloud up and running. Uh, so as pointed out earlier, we've got a few folders in here. So we'll start off with the macros. Macros allow you to provide a bit of extra uh, custom functionality. Potentially, uh, it would be similar to functions in relational databases, either scalar functions or table functions. Uh, it's a piece, a reusable piece of logic that we can use throughout a project. Models, we'll come back to soon, but it's going to be the heart and soul of what we will be dealing with in DBT. We've got seeds, so this is a folder where if you want to load specific information such as country codes or reusable mappings, you'd load that into the seeds table here and benefit of that being version controlled and so we can check, track changes that happen in those files. Snapshots, not all database sources that we have will have will pertain us a history. So by configuring the snapshots in here, we can actually keep track of data changes and data movements over time. And looking back at tests as well. So, so DBT provides a few out of the box tests that are simple functionality like checking for not nulls and having a unique constraint perhaps. But if we want to have customized tests, we have specific use cases that are defined by a business, then this is a chance to apply those here and we can run those as part of our test suite when we do a build. And then next on the list, we have our DBT project. Now, this has a configuration across the project as a whole. So this is, we're just mainly using the out-of-the-box configurations that we've set up. And we can see here that we can actually, we have the paths in terms of where each folder maps to. We, ideally, you'd want to keep as out-of-the-box as you can, but it does give, provide a bit of flexibility if you need to make any changes here. One piece to note is that 
kept this option in here. Now we can see that we've got the, the configuration setting as materialized table. This means all the models we have will be materialized and stored as pers persistent tables. So if we're making a new model, it's going to get stored. There's going to be a new table that gets created in our database. And then it's going to be, that's how it's going to be stored rather than a view or similar. But we'll come back to that and look about how we can change it or how we can override that. Cool, so we'll start in our models. So this is where we'll be, be spending easily 80% of our time in, in this area. So this uh, the models folder contains the subfolders as well in order to let you structure your environment. And I know that DBT has a, a quite a good document on uh, their suggestions on how you should structure your, your environment uh, within the DBT project but they're not prescriptive. You don't have to follow them. It allows for a bit of flexibility and customization as well, but these are a good starting point. So for us, we'll, we'll start with the, one of the easy options and that's the staging restless table. So this is our first model we've made. As you can see here, all this, all this does is points to the raw database of our Snowflake warehouse, looks in the FightDB schema and goes to the restless table. Now we've hard coded the database reference here and we've hard coded the column names and that works fine. It's returning data back. It looks, the data looks good. And we know that it's connected to the warehouse. What happens if you need to change the column names? What happens is this table is used amongst other models rather than just one that we currently have or if it's used across several. Are you going to go in there and risk a global find and replace, just trying to find that particular instance and match all little queries? Uh, there's a fun times I've had in the past doing that. Uh, so just having this hard coded like that isn't isn't really optimal. I think there's a better way that we can achieve that. And so if I co cancel out that. And now we have our first exposure to a ginger. Code block. So you can tell by the curlies over here that we've, we're enter, entering the ginger world and anything in between these brackets will be interpreted as such. So ginger comes with a command called source. And there's a couple of parameters with source. We, we provide a source name, which we'll get to in a second, and we provide a table name. Now the table name is fairly straightforward. It's the direct table name of our object in our database. Cool, but we've got this fight stats here, here and uh, let's have a look into how it is able to interpret that. So we head into our schema.yaml file. So this is the first introduction to YAML. And here I've, I've told it that this is the place that we're going to list our sources. And I've provided it the name fight stats. So as we saw earlier, this is what it's referencing when we provide the, the source name. And as we saw in the database reference, the database we want to reference is raw. All the tables we need are under the fight DB schema. And I've listed the table names directly. So here's the wrestlers one, the wrestlers table we were looking at. And here's all the matches tables there, ready to reference and uh, ready to use. And so if we if we run that table, we should expect that we'll get the same result back because all it's doing is being able to use a template with replacement statement to achieve the same result. It returns results, which is good, but we can also use the compile statement to just double check the compiled SQL that it returns. And we should see here indeed that if I were to highlight that, that it returns the same statement as the one up above. Yet in this instance, we were able to update our references all in the one place in the schema.yaml file. Cool. Justin, do you have something to add to the schema.yaml file there? Yeah, there's one thing I wanted to point out back on your script there is this is a very, very simple example that Gerald is showing you where, where you have a Jinja block um, in your script. That can get a lot more complex as you get more advanced with it. But as you can see where he's, he's hit that compiled SQL, it doesn't matter how advanced that you get, DBT is always going to convert it to SQL to run against your warehouse or data store. Um, so no matter what's in there, if it looks like it's crazy and you're trying to make sense of it and someone else wrote something that you looked at, if you get that compiled SQL, it gives you a command that you could literally take and copy and run directly on your warehouse. So it kind of helps a lot with trying to wrap your head around the Jinja if it's something that you're new to. 
um, being able to compile it in SQL and see what it's actually running um, is a is a huge benefit, in my opinion, to to being able to use DBT. All right, awesome. Thanks, Dustin. And we can already see here, as we mentioned before, there's quite a there's a lineage graph we have access to. Now, this is very simplistic at this stage, but it's been able to identify the the source we had, so from white stats of wrestlers. It's able to identify the model that we're currently working with. And there's a downstream one over here, which I'll get into shortly. Uh, but already we can see there's a, uh, we've got lineage and we've got a big, a bit of a DAG forming. Now this gets a bit more complex later down the line and I'll show, uh, show you that shortly. Um, but for now, we've, we've covered the source function. So let's go into another powerhouse function, which is the ref function, which is used in this particular model. So we're going to dive into our mart and go to the wrestlers model. Now this is fairly simple. Uh, like like before, it's in the Jinja code block, and we have the ref statement. So the ref statement simply pulls a model name from anywhere in our project. So in our case, we're looking at the staging dot wrestlers sequel. So it's going to pull the, it's going to select all the columns from that. And so if I were to compile that one. Uh, it, it should return a statement and it should replace it with our destination database, so analytics, flight analytics, staging wrestlers, the location where we're publishing our models. Now, if I would go ahead and preview that, uh, we should come back with a result set. Oh, no. Ooh. We come back with an error. How did we get an error? So obviously I tried to query our database and it couldn't find a table called analytics.fightanalytics.stagingwrestlers because we needed to deploy our particular models. So what we need to do now that I've made the changes to staging.wrestlers, we are gonna run the dbt run command. Now with the dbt run command, it's gonna execute the models that were created against our target database. We can actually select, uh, we can actually choose to only run particular models like select our staging wrestlers tables. But because I'm most sort of confident about a project, I'm going to run everything. So I'm going to run it without parameters. DBT run deploys everything we have. And so it's it's going to come here and run all the models. And we can see the, the logs. So we've got detailed summary and detailed logs about what it's doing in the, in the background and what it's running. So we can see stage.wrestlers over here. Okay, table created model and flight analytics staging wrestlers. Let's have a quick sneak peek if it's quick enough to do that. And we can see everything has passed so far. So that's, that's run successfully. And now if we were to run, run that one again and preview that, Pull up the analytics, fight analytics tables, and we should see our staging wrestlers tables there. So we know it's there and it's created itself. I didn't have to go in and create the table. DBT did that for me. That's quite a huge one. And it's returning uh, now, now it's returning data as well. So now it's able to uh, collect the data it needs. Any additional comments from you, Dustin? And no, I think that's a so pretty far, great so idea. good. Yeah, so far, right. so good. Excellent, cool. And and just like that, we've got that. And so now we can direct the lineage through the graph as well. Yeah, maybe okay. one comment there. As you do get more advanced and you have lots and lots of models, these are obviously very simple examples. That DAG that you see there in the lineage can get really, really large because you have a lot of dependencies. Um, just know that that can get very, very complex, but it's also very, very useful when you're trying to figure out, okay, what happens if I change this model? What is it going to impact within the rest of my models? It's very helpful in determining, okay, this is everything that's going to be impacted if I go in and change this or something happens to it. But just know that those can get pretty, those can get very robust as you really start to build out your DBT project. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I'm, um, I'm well prepared with a, another little example of how complex it can get, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into <laughs> that a bit shortly. So, but I'm glad you glad you brought that up. Now, interesting to note, we can see on a little dag here that wrestlers is kind of the final state. This is a presentation layer view. It's not returning very many results over here, and 
currently it's being persisted as a table because that's our global functionality, our global default. So in this case, I want to keep everything else as a table. However, I do want this actually to be showing as a view because it's able to handle it. It's closer to the presentation layer. And so we can add a config, another Jinja configuration option up here, which specifies that this particular model is materialized as a view rather than the table. Oh, so I'm going to go ahead and save that. Uh, this time we'll go dbt run select wrestlers. So we'll, we'll only go against the wrestlers model for now. And we'll run that. So previously we saw the wrestlers table over here. So hopefully once our code runs, we should be able to actually see it pop up as a table over here as a view. There we go. Just in time, we have a view with the definition that we assigned earlier. So that's that's the amount of customization that you can get get from it. And the fact that you can override global config values allows just for a bit more flexibility uh, around your project. Oh, as Dustin mentioned, I think we'll go into uh, a, a scenario that's slightly bit more complex. So as we saw from our initial data set, there were a heck of a lot of match tables that we actually need to join in order to extract the information. It has a lot of useful insights in there. So this is the, going to be the basis of our data model for this particular use case. But as you can see, it's, it's actually doing some big, awful, horrible query here, which you know DBAs are going to have my head for just looking at this. And hopefully we'll have some time soon to um, or have some time to, to see if we can simplify this. But as you can see, we've got a bit more of a DAG going on. So we've specified models earlier down the chain, specified events, matches, promotions, and we've got an event summary down the end here. So we can actually reference prior models and DBT handles the dependencies for us. It knows to load the events, matches, and promotions before we load the event summary and titles. We don't. We don't have to deal with that. It does it by itself seamlessly, which is a fantastic. It's a huge one for us. And finally, this is one of our presentation layer views. It's just doing some basic summary across the uh, across our, our data model that we've defined. And now the next awesome part of it is the documentation. So I'd love to be able to hand off to someone in my team or maybe even a customer to be uh, to be able to review the documentation and see where everything is coming from. And to do that, I'd run the dbt docs generate command. And so once that generates, uh, you, it'll show it'll you'll be able to click up here and view the the current state of the documentation, which uh, shows some really useful insights over here. So if we go to so we've got our sources identified over here, we've got our projects, uh, models, and we'll go to the event summary mark. Great, and we can see some details without having to dive into the database. So we've got column names, we've got column types, models where it's referenced to. So following models that actually reference this or where it's referenced from, and some basic code blocks. Uh, one thing to note is that there's no descriptions. It doesn't say if there's tests running. There's no description about that. So to a maybe a customer, potential customer, they don't know what this is looking at. And so the way to get those up to date is we head back into the schema.yaml file. And here's a little one I prepared earlier. So it's it's here where you provide it some information to be able to describe the model that you're creating. So probably giving it a name, making sure you got the column names in there, uh, making sure you've got some descriptions and we've got some basic tests as well. We've got a not null and a unique test against the promotion column. So that's what we that's what we want to actually run before we, uh, that's, that's the type of thing we want to run and be able to test as we go along. And um, so if I just quickly do another dbt docs generate, uh, what we should see here is that we are, once we republish our documentation and view it again, uh, we, we should be able to see these descriptions uh, pop up against this particular table. And you'd probably want to continue, you know, in terms of best practice, do it for all the models that you have, because the more detailed information you have, the easier it is to access to different people. And we can see there's a couple of tests here. There's a unique and a not null test. And there's another command to actually run those. So if we go to dbt test, 
and I want to run all the tests in my suite. There's currently only two, but this command will run everything. And what, should we, what we should expect is that it's going to go ahead and run those particular tests. So there was a un, uh, not null uh, event summary test. And so that was checking that that column didn't have any nulls, which it passed, but it failed on the unique test. So unfortunately, we had a failure because there are multiple promotions in there. It would make sense because a promotion can have multiple events in the table. So that was probably not a particularly good example of a test there. Um, but if we move that test over to the promotion event, the combination of our promotion and our event, uh, if we run the test again, uh, that one should pass on that one. Cool, and that, that basically covers, a, it's a very well-worn tour, but that sort of covers everything we've kind of demonstrated in the demo. Now, I wish I could show absolutely everything there is to show, in DBT, but I need probably more than an hour for that. So I think we'll wrap up the demo at that point, Dustin. Yeah, so just maybe one comment over um, what you just showed, Gerald, and that was a great overview of really showing some of the, how just how simple DBT is. Um, as you can see through looking through this, the hardest part of using this is really kind of writing your actual transformation statements. Now we didn't show any, very difficult transformations, but, um, you know, if you're, again, if you're comfortable writing select statements, you're going to be able to build these things. Um, it's not very difficult. Those added components, the DBT commands are very simple. The YAML are very simple. Um, you can get kind of, you can get advanced with the Jinja stuff, um, but you can also keep it pretty high level. And it's something that you can involve and grow with over time. It's not something that you have to be a Jinja expert when you go in and work with this. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love this tool. I've spent so much of my career writing SQL that this tool was very, a very easy transition kind of going from that world um, more into the analytics space. So, um, real quick, as we wrap up here, I'm gonna sh kind of kick back over to the slides and wrap this up. So. Um, just real quick, what we learned throughout this session, we learned that DBT is a SQL-based data transformation tool that utilizes software development best practices to transform data for reporting, analytics, and data warehouses. We learned how it fit into the modern data stack and the benefits of using it. And then we learned some of the fundamentals needed to get started on your project. So again, we've showed you some of the base level stuff and just how simple it is to get up and rolling. But there's obviously there's a whole lot more, as Gerald mentioned, that we could dive into here that we just unfortunately don't have the time to get into. Um, we hope you have enjoyed this session. We've certainly um, been thrilled to be here and have appreciated you being a part of this. Uh, please reach out to us via LinkedIn or our contact information that was on the About Us slide if you do have any questions or shoot us any messages. We'll be happy to answer them and share anything else with you.